and welcome once again to the Smart Money, Dumb Money Show. And I'm your host, as usual, Keith Richards, I'm President and Chief Portfolio Manager at Value Trend Wealth Management. And today we're doing an interview. And as you know, I've done a series of interviews with really interesting guests. And the purpose of my interviews is to bring to you guys the, the real outsider information people. You guys hear enough about the technical side of the world from me. I brought in people that come from all different aspects of financials. And this guest is a guest that I really wanted to have on. In fact, uh, a little background. Um, it's Jamie Purvis, and he's with Horizons ETFs. And if you're familiar with Horizons ETFs, you guys know that I've, inter I've, I've uh, quoted Brooke Thackeray a lot on the blog. Brooke runs or is a management consultant, I think is a correct term. Research for, advisor. Advise, yeah, advisor for uh, the, the uh, hack, the Horizon Seasonal ETF. I've been good friends with Brooke for many, many years. And Jamie is an expert in all of the different alternative stuff. So he's the executive VP with Horizons ETFs and he's head of institutional sales and he does national accounts and educational stuff. And we're going to be talking not about the boring old ETFs that, you know, here's the, here's the utility sector or whatever, although they do have those kind of boring ETFs, they have their real specialty is the, uh, the alternative space. And just before I bring Jamie on to, uh, to talk, I wanna just say that this is the second shot at doing this interview because I did a full interview with Jamie about a month ago. It was actually just before Christmas. And then I forgot to record it. So um, bad on me. And I really appreciate that Jamie has had enough patience and understanding to come back and redo the video. And I, I assured him that I'm recording it this time. <laughs> so, yeah, it, was, it was tough, Keith, because we really nailed it in December. Yeah. The best one ever, probably. And now you don't know what you're going to get. Yeah, we, we, we're just like so boring now because we've already done this talk. Well, anyway, so Jamie, why don't we uh, start off like I've known you for, I don't know, since the early 1990s. Late 90s, yes. Late 90s, okay. Yeah. And you were originally, uh, you and your father were uh, running or promoting a hedge fund. And I actually, at the time, uh, bought some of that hedge fund. And then you moved into Horizons and... Um, you know, have, you guys have really done some special things. So give me a little bit of background on what you're doing lately. Yeah, we are, uh, well, Horizons ETFs started off as Horizons Funds uh, back in the mid 90s. And I was working there in Vancouver. My uncle, in fact, did start Horizons. Uh, and we were, as you say, an, a retail alternative shop, meaning that we sold alternative products. Then we just called them hedge funds to retail advisors. Uh, and I moved from Vancouver to Toronto in 1998 to open up the Eastern distribution. And now we're based here. The company has, of course, grown massively from, I think, when I joined on May 1st, 1995. So dating myself here almost 28 years from 17 million. I was the third employee, the first one not named Fred. And, uh, you know, I, I stuffed envelopes and watered plants right from the, the get-go. And I've done everything. And now we're uh, now I'm the EVP at a 25, almost $25 billion dollar. ETF company that, as you say, Keith, you know, we're, we are known for alternatives that really we started off in the ETF world as the leverage ETF company. A lot of people know us for being the first marijuana ETF in the world as well. So they think of us as sort of out there and certainly our catchphrase is innovation is our capital. But what we would say is that we're a grown up ETF company. We look like from an asset distribution perspective, like any of the big global giants, over 70% of our AUM is in this sort of traditional low cost beta, meaning index tracking ETFs. Now, some of those indexes are ones like you talk about utilities or something like that, they're smaller sectors, uh, midstream oil and gas, but our biggest ETF is tracks the TSX 60, it's ticker symbols HXT and it's a $4 billion ETF. So we do a number of things. We like to think we do them well. One of the places where we have been at, at the Forefront, because I can't say at the vanguard, so I'll say at the forefront, uh, is in alternatives and what maybe what we think of as thematic ETFs, right? So when we're thinking about thematic ETFs, really we're thinking about the evaluation of emerging potential themes, things that we think will, that are observable 
structural changes in demographics and technology behavior or politics. So marijuana would be a key there, actually, if you think about what marijuana was at the time in 2017 when we when we launched it, it was the political landscape was changing, it was legalized, right? It was becoming commercialized. Uh, companies were going public with with marijuana. And for a while, one of the, one of the names in, in the marijuana space canopy was in the TSX 60. We think eventually there will be a master uh, marijuana company in there, but that was really our first stab at, at, at thematics. And admittedly, when we got into the space, it was a little, uh, it was very nascent. We may have been even a little too early. The ETF was a, was probably not as perfect as it should have been at launch. But so what we've learned from that is to is to look for better investability, meaning a broad group of publicly traded companies with enough liquidity. Any ETF manufacturer needs liquidity in the underlying names of the ETFs that allow us to provide that target exposure to the theme with more of a medium term to long term time frame. You know, we're, when we were into marijuana, it was very early days. Right now, if you think of some of the topics we're going to cover today, they're early. They're growing. They may have been around for a while, but now they're becoming more and more commonly accepted. Or technologies driving their ad, 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 their ad, their adoption. Uh, so it's it's really changed, and we're not the only ones doing this by any stretch. Um, but that's sort of the background to me and the company and how we are, how we got. Yeah, well, what's what's cool about Horizons is that they're it's a Canadian firm, and Canadians can buy. There, like you said, there are companies in the U.S. that are are offering somewhat similar. For for example, the inverses, yeah. um, but you guys are the Canadian way of buying an inverse, and you can buy an inverse, for example, on the uh, TSX, not just the U.S. stuff. So it, it's it's great. And so I, I'd like you to. I mean, there's many many topics we're going to cover, and I'll maybe just I mean spit a couple out, and then. You know, if you want to launch into other, but let's start off with the inverses because that's the most, that's the easiest one to start off with. Um, maybe you can just give us a background on what you guys offer there. But also, I, I wouldn't mind, Jamie, if you would explain just sort of quick mathematics behind the daily resets and how that applies to the double leverage versus the single ones. Because sure. I often talk about the single, your single ETFs, single inverse. They're actually almost 100% negatively correlated to the underlying versus this the doubles and stuff are not so much. So we'll talk about that if you don't mind. Yeah, and very briefly, briefly, what these instruments are are used for. They're ETFs that certainly we didn't we did not create this concept that came out of the US. And when we looked to launch in Canada, we went to the three big US companies that did this, who are sort of a papa bear, mama bear, baby bear in terms of how they were to work with and how big they were in the market space. And we partnered at the time with a group called ProShares. And so we launched our beta pro ETF, sort of doing that. And originally we just started with the two times ETFs, meaning two times or negative two times the daily performance of the underlying index. So if we're talking about the TSX 60 and it goes up 1% on the day, the two times or what we call the bull plus ETF would go up 2% on the day. And the bear or the negative few times would go down 2% on the day. And so people would look at that and say, hey, these are really great tools for really expressing convic conviction in a position, right? Really using leverage effectively, but also for hedging, right? Which was the use that, that you looked at, but you're more comfortable with negative one times. But if we think about Canadians, I mean, I would do, I've done hundreds and hundreds of presentations for uh what we call the do-it-yourself network at the at the what we used to be known as the discount brokerages. And I would say to this room of 50 people, how many people here own Canadian bank stocks? And every hand in the room goes up. And I'd say, how many of you have owned them for five years? And, and you know, hands are up 10 years, two hands drop, 15 years, 20 years. I had one presentation where one of the guys in the back had owned his bank stocks for 60 years. So when you get in those positions, of course, what you have is an extraordinarily low adjusted cost base, right? Ethan, so from a tax management perspective, you say, hey, I may think my bank stocks are too dependent upon the too big a portion of my portfolio, or I think they're susceptible to purchase some weakness right now. But actually coming out of that position is a taxable event for a lot of people. And uh, we pay enough taxes in Canada that people really want to avoid paying taxes where they can. So instruments like HFD, the Horizons Financial Down, which gives you negative two times the performance of effectively the, the banking segment in Canada, 
allow you to hedge that exposure, meaning that you can accept that risk because you're putting in a hedge. And you're, in that case, you're using leverage, meaning if you've got $100,000 of exposure, you only need $50,000 in, in HFD ETF to effectively remove all your market exposure on that day. Now, using the one times, you'd only be hedged halfway using the same amount of capital, but that could be all right, right? What you're concerned about is managing your hedge and reducing your losses or what you expect to lose if you think that sector exhibits weakness. So that's a, that's a big use. And what I would point out is there are differences in how the negative one time or the one time and the negative one time perform relative to the two time and the negative two time. On the day, it's very simple, right? I gave the example of the TSX 60 being up 1%. Well, HX, HXU, Horizons TSX up, would be up 2%, and HXD would be down 2%. What happens at the end of the day is we, we take your winning or losing and apply that to your initial capital, meaning if you've invested $100, we give you $200 of exposure in HXU on that day, or negative $200 of exposure on HXD. At the end of the day, we take what that $200 turned into, let's say, on the up, it went up 1%. So you're, you know, if you've been in the index, you have $101. But now, because we gave you $200 of exposure in HXU, you've made $2. So now the actual cash you have in hand is $102. So the next day, when we apply the leverage to your cash, you have $204 of exposure. Whereas if you've just been in long that index, you would have uh, you'd have $1 of additional exposure, not $4 of additional exposure. So the reality of how those ETFs work over a term longer than one day is that it's the summated, it's a summary of the compounded daily returns over whatever your period is. So it means that if the trend is straight, right, value trend, if we get a nice trend that's straight up, every day you're compounding your gains. Right? You're, you're reinvesting your gains on a daily basis, which is great if you get the trend right. It's even great if you get the trend, if the trend is strong, but you get the bet wrong, because every day you're taking away from, from the capital you have in, uh, invested against the market. So what, it, what that means is that the trend is your friend over a long period of time, but volatility is not. And so if you get markets that move up and down a lot, and you're in a leverage ETF and you're holding it, what you're going to get is days where you get gains, but then you have more money invested and you're levered on that money when the market goes down the next day. So you can actually get greater volatility in your leverage ETFs uh, than you would in the underlying index. So that's why uh, certainly we look at them as tactical trading tools is how we look at them. And that's how, that has how the OSC looks at them as well. Uh, in the States, FINRA has said, look, you can hold these instruments for longer if you know what you're doing effectively. So understand that over time, your real return may deviate from your expected return. And what I say that expected return is really important because the intuitive thing is say, oh, I'm in a two times leverage ETF, market goes up 10% over the year, I should be up 20%. But we know it's not day one to day 365. And let's say there's 250 trading days in the year. It's not day one to day 250, what's the difference times two? We know it's two times what happened on day one, rebalance and two times what happened on day two, so you get that. That's why I talk about that compounded summation of the daily leverage returns yeah. that can, in a highly volatile environment like 2008, right? You can see an ETF that's flat. That's right, an index that's flat. The big example is gold miners over that period was down 1%. But the negative ETF, the bear plus ETF was down 37%. And the bull plus was down like 53%. So what had happened was that there was such extreme volatility in there over the period that even though the index ended up flat, that volatility had massively eroded returns. But then you go through a period like quantitative easing afterwards, where if you're leveraged invested in the S&P 500, you've more than ever performed that two times expectation. So that's that's what we talk about. The, the math is actually day, 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 not starting to end whatever that period is for you. Right. So, and I'll, I'll bring this up that, uh, in fact, the viewers can, can uh, do a search. We have a search engine on our blog. And I've covered the uh, Horizons um, single inverse uh, against the S&P 500. And I've done this study many, many times. I've shown, I do a, an actual correlation line at the bottom of the chart. Just type in uh, um, 
single inverse on the search engine for the blog. And you'll see that this the horizon single inverse and underline the word single are actually very, very close to what we're trying to achieve as a perfect negative. Nothing's perfect because you got fees and all that stuff. But, you know, it's like 99 plus percent negatively correlated to the market. And that's an incredible hedge for someone who is risk adverse. And the, the, I've never used the doubles, truthfully, yeah. because of that volatility. I'm not a super short-term trader. Now, people that are short-term traders can benefit immensely from these. But personally, if I think, think that the market is going to go down, for example, over the next month, I have no problem with buying the single inverse because I can offset the equal amount of exposure in equities. So like Jamie's trying to explain that the doubles are for really short-term traders and doubles and more, some you can get triples and everything out there. Um, and whereas the singles are actually a, not a bad hedge. And, and I've done the studies. I can prove that to you if you do it on the blog, like look it up on the blog, you'll see. It's a very, very good hedge, um, almost perfectly negatively correlated. Anyways- the Math is the um, math, Keith. You're absolutely right. The math, basic math. Is, yeah. is the math and you, you get exactly what you expect from the single. The addition of leverage to compounding creates a bit of a distortion that makes it more complicated and means investors need to be very careful in understanding what they're doing. That's right. Yeah. So um, so that's the leverage stuff. And are the ETFs uh, that are uh, geared towards, you know, kind of hedging with uh, with inverse uh, relationships. But you've got some really this is where we're going to get into the juice now, because there's, this, there's some stuff that Horizons does that is absolutely unique. Um, let's let's talk about you know for example one of the one that that is interesting I find is is your currency your you, you know people do U S Canadian swaps really quite an interesting idea you guys put together and uh, why don't you explain how how that one works yeah uh, real estate Keith we we have two currency ETFs right one that we hadn't touched base on before but I think might be interesting for a lot of your clients who are like you spend part of their year uh, in the U S Canadians who spend time down there. And anyone that's ever tried to convert currency through their bank account knows that that is a costly procedure. So we have an ETR called DLR, and it has a US class share as well called DLR.U. Those are the ticker symbols. And you can buy DLR, and it gives you exposure to the US dollar. You can then sell, you can journal that over. Even you would know how to do this in, in accounts for your clients. Journal DLR, DLR over to a US account and sell it as DLR.U. And all you're paying there is the trade cost, which I think for most, for, as a portfolio manager, your trade costs are, are minimal to nil. And you pay the bid ask spread of a, of, a, of a basis point. So effectively, you're converting Canadian currency to US and US currency back to Canadian almost in a frictionless manner. Whereas if you do it through your bank account or go to, go to your bank, they're charging you somewhere in the neighborhood of up to 3% each way. So really, really cost-effective way to convert your currencies. But the other thing people don't realize about currencies is that's actually the largest global market. Bigger than stocks, bigger than bonds, bigger than oil and gas, bigger than gold. Currency is where trillions of dollars trades uh, easily and, and seamlessly. And so we've partnered with CIBC who have a, a, a currency strategy group based out of Montreal. And they manage about $35 billion for corporate clients running currency strategies and hedging strategies. And they uh, trade 32 global currencies, long and short versus US dollar and Canadian dollar. So they're participating. They're looking at what's going on in, in Turkey, right? And they're short the Turkish lira, right? They're short the Russian ruble. Actually, when Russia invaded Ukraine, they'd just gone from being long the ruble to being neutral and then have been short. So uh, globally, a number of things that they can take advantage of from a currency perspective that are really very difficult for regular investors to do on their own, let alone from an execution perspective, but from a strategy perspective. Um, and the nice thing about currencies traditionally is that it's a non-correlated asset class to the stocks and bonds that you would traditionally hold. You know, we can say equities and fixed income, or we can say stocks and bonds that most clients hold in their portfolios. So it's a really effective diversifier because currencies move in a different manner than stocks and bonds typically. 2022 might be a bit of a of a noticeable difference, right? We saw massive U.S. dollar strength in the in, in the face of a of a 
of a global crisis, we'll call it, but um, on a normalized basis, historically, currencies move very differently from uh, equities and fixed income. So, so you guys, uh, beyond just the straight conversion factor that might appeal to snowbirds, you have a, like a managed currency mm -hmm. ETF. What is the ticker on that for the viewers? Is HARC, H-A-R-C. H-A-R-C. Horizons actively, uh, active global currency. I'd have to look it up. Like I have 107 tickers, Keith. I'm, I'm yeah, just, no, I mean, I'm asking you to remember. The four letters that are on the board are the most important letters. Yeah. Yes, that's right. Okay, so good. I mean, that's again another because a lot of people that are watching this video are do it yourselfers. Um, yeah. and so that's the kind of thing that, you know, for people that are looking for alternative. And that's the topic of today is alternative investments. And let's get into your and my favorite topic. We're going to talk about a few things, but this one I wanted to get right into, which is the energy, uh, the alternative energy stuff, because, you know, value trend has been trading uranium. We were really early on the trade a couple of years ago. We were buying uh, 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 uranium, um, but now we're, we also have uh, uh, lithium in their aggressive account. So tell me all about your ETFs in that space. Yeah, I mean, I think if we look at the global energy space, we see traditional energy commodities like oil and gas are experiencing supply issues amid global conflict, and the future seems murkier for them. Additionally, you know, I mean, that speaks directly to what's going on in Ukraine right now. Um, and I touch on this later when I think about uranium, but, you know, continental Europe is very fortunate that they've had a massively mild winter, right? Because otherwise their gas prices and their demand for gas would be through the roof. So, that's a, that one factor. If you look at the global conflict, you know, strained relations between OPEC and non-OPEC, right? Where effectively, oil prices are controlled by the Saudis. Uh, but we also have increased low carbon government policies, right? And uh, regardless of your political stripe here in Canada, we look at sort of the federal government has tried to initiate an, an almost abrupt transition from carbon-based to green energy. And I think everybody knows it's very hard to make abrupt shifts like that. You need a, probably a better timeline, a bit of a runway to achieve that. But we do have uh, you know, low carbon government policy, but that even affects electric vehicles. I think California said they don't plan on allowing gas driven vehicles by 2030. Uh, Canada wants half the vehicles to be electric by 2030. Um, I'm not against electric vehicles by any stretch, but I don't think it's very pragmatic to try and mandate a time change like that. If you do drive an electric vehicle, you know how carefully you have to plan your stops to recharge, right? And you, and, and how well yours charges and how well it does in cold weather, right? Uh, an EV in California or Florida has a much longer battery life than an EV here in Ontario. And I think, you know, to two days after our last chat, Keith, in December 22nd, I think it was, when we did the, the original version of this, we, we got hit by a major storm on the 23rd and 24th. Well, my brother, who lives in England, uh, had to drive from Toronto to Kingston on the 24th. And if you know what happened that day, you know that that was a major snow area. Uh, he was driving a four-wheel drive car and a, and a gas driven. So he was able to make it through the seven hours it took him to get what normally takes two hours and 15 minutes. Stopped on the 401 for an hour and it was 15 below. So you have to run your car. Well, you know what was in the ditch on the side of the road? hundreds of EVs, right? That's a the, you know, anecdotal from him, like maybe it's dozens of them, but there, there are not liabilities there, but there are still weaknesses in there. So you look at those factors, you got an increasing cost of extraction and pollution relative to falling costs for renewables. They, they could disincentivize uh, future fossil fuel consumption. We look at uh, McKinsey put out a global energy perspective that said that the projected peak in demand for fossil fuels should be within five years. And uh, regardless of what they charge our federal government for uh, consulting contracts, McKinsey tend to have a pretty good, good degree of insight into a lot, of, a lot of these factors. So we look at it and say, you know, tying back to what we talked about originally at the outset was this considerations for what are the matters that we can work with here. And so, you know, a few years ago, we were, a, a, like you, ahead of the curve, big fans of uranium. And... Uh, if you look at the price of uranium as a raw mine commodity, it increases and decreases based on global usage. But as you get more demand for nuclear, I'm not going to say nuclear, 
we're going to say nuclear. We're not going to George Bush this. Bush. <laughs> but yeah, there are, you know, there's 443 nuclear reactors globally, and that number is increasing. Japan's reopening uh, reactors uh, despite Fukushima, right? And, uh, you know, having learned some lessons from there, the only place in the world that is closing, that has closed nuclear reactors lately is Germany. And that's really at the tail end of a Merkel led shift from reliance upon nuclear and other and coal to Russian that gas. So we'll see how that plays out over the next few years. But um, there is bipartisan support in the US for nuclear. Um, you see a big ramp up of the American Nuclear Infrastructure Act and that's not the National Uranium Reserve. Uh, and global electricity production has come back to pre Fukushima levels. And if you look at what's on the on the future there, we're looking at what they call micro reactors. The micro reactors are smaller or SMRs, they call them small modular reactors, and they normalize about 300 megawatt uh, electric hours versus um, the 1600 that a more traditional nuclear reactor would, would have. So what you're seeing is our advances in the technology. And those those SMRs are, you know, realistically, they're based on repairing of the American nuclear powered subs that can stand underwater for months and months at a time because of the efficiency of the electricity. So we see massive demand for uranium. And if you look at what's happened, you know, we have the uranium ETF that is about 80% the producers and 20% physical uranium. <clears throat> uh, but it, if you want pure physical, Sprott have a really cool tool where they have effectively sort of cornered almost the global uranium market because they anticipate similar demand uh, for the physical there. We look at, at, at a diversified uh, approach to the physical, but uranium makes a ton of sense. And the biggest concern with uranium is what happens when things go wrong at nuclear reactors. You know, we think of Three Mile and Fukushima. Fukushima, mm -hmm. obviously, a, a, a massively exogenous event. But what do you do with your use 236? That's your that's your radioactive uranium that that is created through the creation of nuclear energy. And there are, you know, historically it's been wrapped in cement and buried deep in the earth. But there are alternatives now to that, you know, part of, you know, and, and it's said tongue in cheek and partially not tongue in cheek is we now have multiple private carriers who will, who can get to space. And the thought is, what if we, as long as we don't get an explosion upon takeoff, which is the biggest risk, is that you fire this and you just send it in a satellite towards the sun. Because the sun is effectively millions of nuclear reactions going on every second uh, of every day, so you don't have any worries about warping your time space continuum or anything sort of sci-fi like that. But realistically, the future for your your uranium we think is very bright uh, because of increased demand, limited supply of uranium, and the efficiency with which it provides electricity in a space that, and the ability to create these smaller reactors and mini reactors. Because we obviously have a weakened infrastructure power grid uh, in, in North America in general. Right? So being able to do this on a regional basis rather than trying to do it in one big plant and then send it all over. Uh, if you are fortunate enough to know anyone that works in the electrical business in, in the, on the infrastructure side, someone say at Brookfield, you know how much uh, operations goes into moving electricity through the grid. And how they have to buy and resupply and send it, and what happens when the grid goes down. So, uranium is really a very effective solution long term for being very efficient with how we create and distribute ener uh, electrical energy. Yeah, I'm, I'm completely on board with that. I mean, uh, Jamie, we've, we've talked, and, and I have traded in and out of Cameco. So, let me talk about your ETF because you said so everybody's aware of Sprott, they've got the U.U units. Um, so your units, your ETF, you said it's a more diversified, so it's holding, I would assume that the equities and, and the physical, is that right? Correct. And, and uh, what's the ticker on that for the viewers? The ticker symbol is H-U-R-A, okay. the Horizons Global Ukrainium Index ETF. <clears throat> and it's holding, I can tell you, its biggest holding is Cameco, right? It's 22%. Yeah, of course, this is a big guy, yeah. Uh, just shy of 19% is in uh, Kazatomprom, which is a, the Kazakh distributor, and then over 15%, almost 15.5% is in the Sprott physical uranium. Right. Okay. So it's so a good. We've looked around. That's the best vehicle for owning physical. 
So right now we're about 85, 15 uh, stocks to physical. And then, you know, you get next gen and yellow cake and paladin uranium, and then you get into some of the smaller names. So there is a, there is a broad dispersion here in the names, but there's only I think, 15 or 16 names in the portfolio. So the big ones are the ones, you know, but as you say, you could own chemical, but then you don't get the value of owning physical. You don't get some of the smaller yeah. names that have booze. Yeah, no, it's an easier and more diversified yeah. trade. So, so let me ask you, uh, like, cause there's other, you were talking about electric cars. So lithium and all that, um, what do you have in that rare earth and whatnot world? <laughs> what do you, yeah. Well, in this case, we're, we're fortunate that um, we're owned now as we are a Canadian success story. We, we have been sold to a, a Korean asset manufacturer called Mirai Global Asset Investments. They manage about $650 billion worldwide. Um, they have a big background in, in alternatives, but they also own a US ETF company called Global X. Yes. And Global X really launched the, the world's first lithium ETF, and it's LIT, lit, in, yeah. in the US. So when we looked at doing a Canadian version, we talked to them and said, here's how we'd improve what, from what we did originally to what we would do now. Because making changes to an ETF is difficult. You often have to go to shareholder vote if it's material. So it's, they're like, we're going to go with what we have. But we look at, look at it and say, look, lithium is the world's lightest metal. And it's an essential material in lithium ion batteries, obviously. They're called lithium ion batteries, which are massive, as we know about in EVs and renewable energy storage. Right? And if, those of us who've been around long enough in Canada remember Ballard Power Systems, which still exists, right? That, yeah, yeah, I'm yeah. still trying to trying to nail that. But the average electric vehicle needs almost 63 kilos of lithium carbonite for its battery components. So it's very heavy. I talk about that December 24. A lot of those uh, Teslas were also in the ditch. And yeah. they're very hard to pull out because the batteries and the, the cars themselves are so heavy. Yeah. Right? So the, the, those who ha who hadn't run out of juice and, but had slid into the ditches were going to be a while before they got pulled out because uh, our friend Jim and the, on his snowmobile in Trenton couldn't pull out a, a he could pull out a Subaru but he can't pull out a Tesla was effectively my brother's uh, experience. But it, we're expecting demand for lithium to increase about three hundred percent the next decade, and it, from January twenty twenty to to middle of twenty twenty two the price of battery grade lithium. Increased 838%. So it's from $8,000 to $75,000 USD. Most of these deposits are in Australia and South America, but we're seeing there is one in the US. GM just announced that they're investing $650 million into America's largest lithium deposit, which is called Lithium Americas, LAC is a bigger deal. And they're forecasting that, uh, well, sorry, lithium is, is, is going to grow another 300% after growing five times from the beginning of 2021. So I gave you that. 2020 to 2022 number, 2021 to 2023, it's grown five times. So there's massive demand. Uh, the things I talked about earlier about you know mandating EVs, well, that just drives lithium even higher. And we can talk about, you know, we can talk about the downside of lithium, the mining practices, the pollution, all those sort of things. Um, but the reality is demand's there. So uh, I hope people that like lithium and their EVs. Uh, aren't squeamish about that the way they're squeamish about oil sands because they're you know effectively equally as dirty yeah that that's <laughs> i won't get too political but that's right. i mean they, they push an agenda that's supposed to be cleaner energy but it's not right. <laughs> and uh that's that's always that's governments though they they always want to paint the pictures that they want to paint it's i guess we're all in sales aren't we <laughs> so everybody's in sales they got to talk their product right even if the product is completely inferior um, by the way, uh, a friend of mine, you talk about it in the cold weather, um, a friend of mine in Florida recently just told me that his neighbor owns a Tesla, which is supposedly able to get 400 miles on a full charge. And he said, uh, there's, that equation is completely wrong because it basically means you never have your air conditioning on because everybody in Florida has their air conditioning yeah. on. And he says, you know, radios, your headlights, whatever. And then he goes on top of that, uh, he goes, nobody runs their car to like, so you're sputtering up the driveway ready for the charge. So he goes, you know, just to be safe, you're going to leave 10% plus of charge. So he says the typical, he says his neighbor says with the air conditioning on just normal usage, he's getting, despite the claimed 400 miles, he's getting on average 236 miles. The guy's kind of yeah. The 10th of, I guess you'd say, tracks his miles and looks at his charges. And he says he's averaging 236 
between charges to that safety margin of 10%. To the I, next. I assume that 230, 236 miles is also all downhill at a rather steep grade. Yeah, well, they, well they're <laughs> Teslas, they're supposed to be more efficient than stuff. But yeah, like it's like, well, Florida, dead flat. And that is a good point, right? What if you lived in, in West Virginia or British Columbia? It ain't so flat in those places. Yeah. And so what does that do to your so-called 400 miles? So there's a lot of argument against this. I know what it does to my gas when I drive up a hill, right? Yeah, well, definitely. I've, I've driven through the Rockies in, in, in Columbia. Yeah, you're, <laughs> you're totally right. And so that that as it may, it's it's just like a lot of stuff in life. It's it's uh, if there's demand for it, it's going to go up, and that's all that matters to us as stock traders. So, what is the ticker of your uh, lithium ETF? It is HLIT. 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 It's the okay. Horizons Global Lithium Producers Index ETF. Nice. It's okay. just shy of fifty percent Australian exposure, twenty uh, percent US, ten percent Chile. And then, you know, China, Canada, Brazil, Taiwan, South Korea. So it, it, the neat thing about lithium is it is actually a globally diversified portfolio, right? And similarly with uranium, right? So you're, you're getting some of the benefits that people normally talk about that we as Canadians largely ignore because we want to be on Canadian. But uh, it, we go where the opportunity is here and where the, the best products are. Absolutely. Okay, that's great. So um, let's yeah. finish up with emerging technology and you guys have a number of different areas you're kind of looking at and, and focusing on some yeah. semiconductors the metaverse robotics which has been a big topic you know big data all that stuff so give us the there's a lot of topics there so maybe you can kind of bang us through these yeah the big one is semiconductors yeah. <clears throat> right we've got taiwan under political and geopolitical pressure and miss out trying to see they're the massive producer uh, Biden's just announced a whole bunch of plans to build uh, semiconductor manufacturing in the U.S. to bring that back and sort of eliminate that geopolitical risk. But semiconductors are everywhere now. Right? Like I, my car, I don't drive a fancy car and it's three years old, has over a thousand semiconductors in it. Right, So everything is now it's driven by technology. Uh, when I take, you know, it's a Volvo. When I take my Volvo into the Volvo dealership, the mechanic doesn't climb underneath and have a look and open the hood and check it out. He plugs something into the center console and runs a diagnostic and the computer tells him what's going on, what's wrong, right? So you have massive demand and, and you know, very basic use of microcontrollers and memory chips to really sophisticated uh, high performance processors, right? And so semiconductors aren't just one thing. We think of it as one thing. The uses are disparate in, in uh, in or your refrigerator, as well. right? In your refrigerator, or whatever you have. So, yeah. if you, if you, you know, semiconductor sales sort of faltered a little bit in 2019, but it really boosted now as technology jumps, just not just from cars, but to your fridges and your kitchen and all of those places. And so, we think uh, we're fans of, of semiconductors right now. We view them as, you know, they're already a global, big part of the global landscape, but they're, they're only going to continue to grow. We're not going to see less technology, we're going to see more. Uh, the one next probably in that space is, as you and I talked about, is robotics. People think about robotics as, you know, something in the Amazon warehouse going and taking its order and doing the 50 foot forklift going up and taking something off the shelf and all being automated because you don't want some guy who's hungover or stressed for time. So he doesn't, he's not getting his bathroom break or any of that stuff from running a forklift. You want all that stuff done automatically. Uh, they think of that as robotics, but realistically, we think about farmers' fields. You go see those big arms. What they run is satellite imaging that tells them what part of their fields require more water, and it automatically moves the spray arm over to water that or where you're short of, of fertilizer. Big use in robotics is in medical, right? If you think about eye surgery, right? Everyone's having not just cataracts and things, but you know, major eye surgery. Well, the expert in it's 65 years old. And I don't know about you, Keith. I'm you know, I'm over 50 now. I'm not as steady as I used to be. I'm more knowledgeable and more experienced, but not as steady. So you want the young surgeon's steadiness and preciseness with the old surgeon's uh, expertise. And what they've done in this case is that they started uh, using robots to do micro cutting in surgery. So if you need something cut to the hundredth of a millimeter, man, I couldn't even tell you how small a hundredth of a millimeter is. 
but the robot can do exactly what it's supposed to do in that space. So if you talk to anyone you know who's a surgeon, I've got one friend who, who is a surgeon, she said that she doesn't perform surgery with less than three robots in her operating area to do exactly that sort of thing. They can hold, you know, you can get a clamp on them and a robot won't let go, that won't slip. Right? It will hold and it will it'll measure pressure, readjust to make sure everything's clamped up properly. So robotics are sort of way faster than people think. You know, my favorite robots are Robo Sushi, where I go and I, the robot, follows, I fall it over and tells me where my table is. And I punch in my order on my iPad and the robot comes over and stops. He's got a tray on his head and I take my stuff off his head. Now, I love those robots, but those really aren't the robotics that we're talking about here. So robotics are really going to are very advanced uh, and are just more and more increasingly essential in a number of uh, business areas that we would not have conventionally thought of them being present in. And let's say talk about the metaverse. Well, I think the metaverse has proven so far it's not going anywhere. People still, as much as they interact online, they prefer uh, human interaction. Um, so it's it's a bit of a failure at this point in time. Zuckerberg, Mark Zuckerberg, is is doubling down on the metaverse. Right? He's made some substantial changes to their operating model, not just their ticker symbol. Uh, we expect we'll see more effort there. So we've got an ETF there, but frankly, if I were thinking about technology themes, I'd be thinking more about robotics uh, and semiconductors and even effectively big data and hardware, which is, uh, I'm going to say we're, we're maybe not uh, necessarily fans of blockchain, all of us here, but what, or sorry, of, of cryptocurrencies, but we are fans of blockchain. And that's what big data and hardware gets you is the ability to run a digital ledger that has sort of massive opportunity ahead of us and just think about how uh i live in toronto the real estate registry in toronto is still like almost hand drawn right you could put that on blockchain you could cut the cost of your land transfer taxes your costs of of actually selling a house right you sell your house and you'd say oh that's that's expensive and then you realize all the additional fees that come on not just from land transfer taxes but what you have to pay to the city to to have, to have the ledger change there's all sorts of opportunity, we think, in the blockchain space, um, which is effectively big data and hardware, right? You have to have the machinery. So it's one of the things we talk about crypto that goes unsaid is that the amount of energy and computing power used to run crypto is unbelievable. It's multiple factors more than most people understand. So hardware and big data is really an important part of all of this stuff. And as we say, we're going to see more and more technology this is the backbone of how technology is distributed globally so those would be a few of the, of the ones you know one hard stop on metaverse right now let's see how that sorts out and three that are growing and you know will be subject to some growing pains but are massively useful to us in our day-to-day -day operations even we don't recognize it yeah and that's in and, and really jamie i mean that's i think that's it's the main reason i wanted to have you on is that it's not that everybody right now should run out and buy you know a, a, a robotics etf or whatever um but there are things that you guys offer and you know i have no bias by the way i have no connection to horizons i mean i'm a friend of brooks Acres, but that he doesn't work for you anyways he's a, an advisor are we friends but yet we're friends we're friends a long okay. time plus, you know um but uh uh hell I, you don't even give me free lunches so you know <laughs> <laughs> so there's no so what I what I like about Horizons is that you you guys do offer these sometimes a little bit out there sometimes not like the the leverage stuff or the sorry the, the inverse is very straightforward stuff the currency stuff is very straightforward stuff that we can all use and but sometimes investors may be looking for a very particular space and rather than trying to delve in it to them by themselves you know, we're all, anybody that watches this video is a technically orientated investor, whether they're my clients and I'm doing it for them or it's, you know, do-it-yourselfers. We're all technical people that, that are watching today or involved today. And so they can look at the chart and decide if, okay, if that sector makes sense and the chart is breaking out, it's, it's you know, you guys offer great ways to do a, that concentrated trade in a sector that really isn't available as a sector, you know, sort of like, it's not like utilities, you, you, you know, you don't have like 20 different competitors. So, so it's, uh, that's why I wanted to have you on. And I'm just going to finish up because you and I were talking about one 
one sort of sector, it's not really a sector that, that is emerging, is talked about a lot right now, and you guys took a swing at it. And this is another example of why things, just because everybody's talking about it doesn't necessarily mean it's an investment opportunity. Let's talk about artificial intelligence. I mean, this chat GPI, and I understand the basics, but maybe you can run us through why you guys aren't aren't thrilled with the idea and to give us a little history. Well, I, I, I put it into chat GBT and it told me what my answer should be. So, uh, <laughs> no, uh, it's, it's not that we don't believe in AI right now. That's that's not the mess I intended to portray, but we we were early adapters. We actually created an ETF. Our parent company, as I mentioned, is Murray there uh, in Korea at the University of Korea. Uh, they're big investors in the AI department. And so using uh, the business arm of that AI department, we launched an ETF in Canada in 2018, I want to say, 20, yeah, 2018, that effectively used their AI and we gave it a bunch of parameters on the global uh, equity program said, here, you know, we want to, you know, no more volatility than this. Here's the liquidity constraints. Here's the size constraints, here's our sector constraints, and we're not all over, you know, we don't just end up owning American banks or whatever is super favorable, we want a diversified portfolio. And it, uh, you know, it, it was the first ETF we ever launched where we told people, we said, look, don't buy this. We don't know what it's gonna do, we're just sort of launching a travel, and so of course people bought it, right? And, and when you launch the ETF, you launch it with seed capital, meaning typically one of the Canadian banks puts, in this case, it was $5 million of the original uh, 500,000 units at $10 a piece. And we sold out of those 500,000 units in two days, three days, which never happens. <laughs> it takes us weeks to sell out of robotics or a, a metaverse might not even be sold out of right now. And that's what we basically told people, don't buy this. We don't know what it's going to do. And so everyone's like, okay, I'm going to buy it. So <laughs> that's our new strategy for launch going forward. We tell people not to buy our ETFs and see how they do. But effectively, and then we, we move the management uh, the Korean group here left and went to New York or something, I think. And we hired a, a local Canadian AI group to run it. And the results weren't really any better. And in a bull market when they were lagging it, it was a diversified portfolio, but it wasn't providing any any value. So we ended up closing the ETF. And the ticker symbol on that was MIND, M-I-N-D. Um, it doesn't mean we won't try again with a more mature system. I think what I would say is that technology always improves and as does AI, you know, the chat GPT three years ago would have been a disaster too. And I'd say, okay, write this for me and say, oh, go do it yourself, you lazy bugger. Right? Well, that's not what I expect from a chat GPT, but now, you know, <laughs> it's, it's doing your work, it's doing work for people. So I think we look at, the, at this and say, it's not something we don't believe in. It's just, we were so early to it, it didn't, and it didn't work very well. We have to look at it and say, is this really something that people care about, right? Do I want to trust part of my retirement holdings to effectively Skynet, right? And have Arnold Schwarzenegger come back and take all my money from my registered plan <laughs> 20 years later as a cyborg. So we have to be very careful about these things. Mm. Uh, not that we expect it's going to ruin the world, but just look at it say, if we're going to be thematic, we want to be in themes that are more robust and more predictable in terms of how that sector is going to develop, not what returns will be like, but is that sector going to be something we can invest in properly and understand and attribute where the returns come from? That was the other thing about mine is we it it couldn't give us attribution. So here's the parameters that spat out the portfolio, but it couldn't give us reasons why it didn't have that uh, communication capacity as part of its AI in it, which perhaps now we do have. So yeah, it'll it'll advance. I mean, I uh, I recently watched a. Uh, a meeting, sort of one of those on stage discussion things, and it had uh, Jordan Peterson and Conrad Black. And they, Jordan Peterson, he's a pretty smart guy. He covers, he looks at a lot of different things in life. And he started talking about that was my first re real introduction to uh, to this, you know, advanced artificial intelligence. And his comments were because he's a psychologist and he's he's looking at all this this stuff in his profession. And he was saying like, this, this is going to be the future, um, but it's still early, you know, it's, right. it's, you know like you discovered. <laughs> so, 
Anyways, okay, well, listen, uh, Jamie, uh, I literally did record this time. <laughs> so <laughs> there'll have, be no uh, third shot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, no third shot. Uh, so I really appreciate you uh, coming back on and actually allowing our viewers to, to hear from you. And, you know, we've talked about a lot. So uh, maybe tell us how investors can look up some of these funds and where they'll find them on your site, just so if they're interested in this specialized stuff, they, they know where to look. Yeah, what, what we, we our website is revamped about six months ago. So what you can do is go to the top at horizonsetfs.com. Along the top, there's a little magnifying glass, which obviously means search. And then you can just type in uranium or clean energy, and it will give you options below to have a look at it. And then from there, you can go into the Hura, H-U-R-A, that you're just using uranium as an example. You can go in there, and it'll, you can see tabs that tell you the holdings, the performance, distributions, anything like that historically. So you can have a little, a, a good in-depth dive into what the portfolio is all about. And of course, we do have when you're on that site, you can see hotlines. So you can always call in at any time and ask via call or email uh, or in our chat bot to, uh, to ask questions. That's great. Well, thanks again, Jamie. We'll uh, I'll look forward to new developments coming from Horizons because you guys are the innovator company within your field. And so I'm sure there's, there's more great ideas coming down the pipeline. So thanks for the interview. And uh, we'll maybe bring you back on in a year and see what else is new. You got it. Thanks, Keith. Everyone have a great day.